I'm ordering for lunch, so we know we'll take some. Please, if you are having conversation, it's not meant for the batch or mute. So we don't hear what is not meant for our ears. Alex, I, I would like to ask that we mute our mics for now uh, because we are eavesdropping on your private conversations and that's not good. Good afternoon, colleagues. We are scheduled to start at 3 o'clock, and then exactly 3.15, we will begin with the program. So may I crave your indulgence to exercise a little bit more patience until 3.15 when we will have our first speaker. Thank you very much for joining in. Oh. Hello. It will be good if you are the host to, to, to mute all mics from your end. All right. Thank you, bro.
Last Thursday, the uh, world I'm at home. I'm doing something. I'm, I'm doing something at home today, tomorrow. So, mm. okay. Uh, but complaining about computer science and what all that. Did you pass it? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. We have a, a few minutes more and then a few minutes more to go. So kindly bear with us. Uh, we'll start as early at 3.15.
Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, you are welcome to this um, public forum, a virtual forum on the 2020 presidential election petition. Uh, this is being organized by the Progressive Intellectuals of Ghana. The Progressive Intellectuals comprises a cross section of uh, academics and other intellectuals from across the country's tertiary institutions. The uh, progressive intellectuals known as PI, um, it's a think tank. We refer to ourselves as an ideas factory to pursue due diligence, pursue social democratic values that would enhance the development of this nation in ways that will improve the conditions of lives of our people. It is open to all who wish to join. We pay monthly dues of 20 cities, which amounts to 240 cities per annum. We have a constitution and we are registered with the Registrar General's Department of Ghana. We are glad to have you join us this afternoon. Today's forum focuses on the election 2020 presidential petition. As we expressed in a letter that we sent to participants. This is meant for public education. The public has to understand what transpires or what is going on with regard to the petition that has been sent by the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. But we are not limiting the discussion to what is happening at the courts because that is not why we are here. We are here to discuss issues that are related, but relevant to public understanding of where exactly we are, because it is in the interest of the public that we know and follow what is going on clearly without any doubt on our minds. For today, we have three speakers who are all our colleagues. We have Mr. Albert Kwashiga, who will be our first speaker. He is from the University of Professional Studies, Accra. He's lecturer in constitutional law at the law school, UPSA. He is a doctoral fellow at the Widener University, Delaware, Law School in the United States of America. He holds an LLM from the George Washington University Law School in the United States. Mr. Kwashika was the host of analysis on Star FM. And then he was a founding news broadcaster at City FM and the first anchor of its midday news. We are glad to have him share his thoughts, his knowledge and experiences with us. He'll be speaking to us on the topic, judiciary as the anchor of democracy, reflections on elections jurisprudence. Our second speaker is Professor Ransford Jampo. He's an associate professor of political science at the Department of Political Science, University of Ghana. He's also head of the Youth Bridge Research Institute, Accra. Professor Jampo will be speaking to us on the topic, the 2020 election petition and the future of Ghana's electoral commission. We will also have Dean Godwin Adagawine, 
He's senior lecturer and dean at the Center for Practical and Multidisciplinary Legal Education and Training at the University of Professional Studies, Accra. He will be speaking to us on the topic, Public Accountability, the Electoral Commission and Presidential Electoral Justice. Now, each of them would speak for about 30 minutes. We expect to pay keen attention, take down our notes, and then at 4.15, when they are all done, we'll have an open discussion, including questions and answer session. Now, I'd like to remind us again that we should bear in mind that this is a public forum, it's for education, so we must not pass comments that will be contentious. We must exercise due diligence in our presentations. I wish to thank you very much. On this note, I guess we are all prepared and I would like to invite the participants to start. We'll start with Mr. Albert Kwashiga. And I would like to suggest that while the speaker speaks, we all mute our mics. The speaker can unmute his mic and speak to us. Thank you very much. I should also inform that we'll be recording this session for our purposes. Thank you. So over to you, Lawyer Kashiga. We can't hear you. His mic is off. Uh, he has unmuted it. He has unmuted his mic. <coughs> Professor Gavakali, check from your end if you haven't done so at your end, which is perhaps affecting him. Uh, Hello, I, I have unmuted. I have unmuted everyone. That's why I could hear the rest. Yeah. So we should be able to hear Lawyer Kwashiga. The, the signal on his mic shows that when he speaks, the system is speaking in the voice, just that the sound is not coming. So there's a problem. He may have to re-log into the system. Otherwise, um, we may never hear Okay. Something shows uh, that his voice is being picked by the app, but then that we can't hear the, the, the sound. Exactly so. So, Albert, kindly, kindly check out and join in again, and then I'll... Hello, 
Hello, may I ask that? May I ask? May I ask that yes. we unmute our mics? Okay, let's mute our mics now. Albert is joining in and he'll start the discussion. Prof, Prof, I think you have to meet everybody. everybody. Prof, you have to meet everybody. It's difficult to rely on everybody to meet themselves. Yes, okay. just meet uh, the host, meet everybody. Yeah. Good. I saw Lawyer Kwesiga joining in. I wonder if he's, he's through. No funga. Thank you. All right, since we don't want to lose time, is it possible for us to take the second speaker, first, uh, first speaker, we settle the technical challenge. So, Professor Jampu, if you are with us, may we listen to you? Thank you. Is Professor Jampo here? Thank you. From the work, can you please mute the rest of us so that uh, disturbance can be minimal? Shall we proceed? Is Professor is um Laya Koshiga ready? Laya Koshiga, please. Uh, Prof, is it possible you have muted them? So it's possible you have muted them. You need to check that. If you, in our attempt to mute everybody, yeah. you might have muted them. Allow participants to unmute themselves. I've done that. Ah, okay. Fine. Yeah. That's why I could hear you. What about Professor Jampu?
All right. So, can we please take Dean Adegawine if he's ready for us? Hello. Hello. Hello, colleagues. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, please? No. Hello. Hello, yes, we can. Yeah. So I was saying that if lawyer Pashiga is ready, he may, he may kindly start the session. Yeah, we can hear you. We hear the guys right now. By now, everybody. Hello, do we have lawyer Koshiga? What about Professor Jampo? Uh, Prof. Gavua? Yes, please. I think that uh, Godwin Adagwene wanted to start, but I think at the time you had muted him and so he he was talking to himself uh, literally so okay so let's let's have him now and professor jumpo are both not ready maybe you could take godwin now and okay let's make sure let's go with godwin dean we are ready for you sir have you unmuted him hello Pro. yes godwin we can hear you now hello Hi, Godwin. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you hear me, Godwin? Hello, I can hear you. Can you okay, hear me? So yes, you can proceed. Yes, we can. Yes, I am glad to be sharing my thoughts on the theme of the conference with uh, participants today. The topic which I speak on this afternoon is public accountability, the electoral commission and presidential electoral justice. The material I shall rely on for my presentation includes the Fourth Republican Constitution 1992 of Ghana, the petition document filed by the petitioner in the 2021 election petition, and related documents.
I wish to argue that the concept of public accountability is a principal feature of our representative democratic government framework established under the 1992 Republican Constitution of Ghana. When applied to institutions such as the Electoral Commission, the result will be to uphold the notion that sovereignty resides in the people of Ghana, for whose welfare all powers of government are to exercise in the manner and within the limits imposed by the Constitution. I will be arguing that in relation to the ongoing election petition, the Supreme Court may have set the standard too high for ordinary citizens of Ghana to challenge presidential election results in Ghana. On the other hand, the court may have set the standard of public accountability too low for the Electoral Commission, which in the long run may not be in the good interest of our representative democratic dispensation. Now, the first question is, what does public accountability mean? Ladies and gentlemen, I would wish to rely on views expressed by the Honorable Justice J. Uh, K. Major, Major, Major. In an article entitled Public Accountability and Its Problems Under Ghana Law, published in the 1989-1990, volume 17 edition of the Review of Ghana Law. Specifically at page 70. In that article, the learned justice argued that public accountability embraces the examination of the conduct of individuals and institutions in cases where there are complaints that mm. such conducts have not and been in accordance the... with law. In other words, the notion of public accountability simply has to do with ensuring that activities of public institutions and officials are carried out in accordance with the requirements of law. The learned justice further pointed out that public accountability has to do with accountability in public life and under the law. This means that public accountability aims at ensuring legality in all eight forms with respect to the activities of public institutions and officials. In this respect, Public accountability cannot be achieved without the role of the judiciary. The judiciary is the organ of government that specializes in ensuring that the law prevails at all times. The concept of public accountability is not unknown to the 1992 constitution. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, the very first article of that constitution makes the point that
And I'm talking specifically about Article 1 of the 1992 Constitution. And with your permission, I read. The sovereignty of Ghana resides in the people of Ghana, in whose name and for whose welfare the powers of government are to be exercised in the manner and within the limits laid down in this constitution. Two things stand out clearly from this provision. That all powers of government are to be exercised for a defined purpose, which is the welfare of the people of Ghana. And the second point is that said powers are to be exercised in a manner and within the limit imposed by the 92 constitution, certain in relevant circumstances. It means therefore that institutions and individuals that will public power, and for that matter, the powers of government cannot exercise such powers for any purpose they so wish or in any manner they may want to, but must observe the requirements of the constitution and other laws in relevant circumstances. That exactly is what public accountability entails. But Article 1 is not the only provision in the constitution that underscores the notion of public accountability. In fact, a step forward to Article 2 strengthens that notion. And it states, again, with your permission, I read. This constitution shall be supreme, shall be the supreme law of Ghana, and any other law found to be inconsistent with any provision of the constitution shall be to the extent of the inconsistency void. Any person who alleges that A, an enactment or anything contained in or done under the authority of that or any other enactment, or B, any act or omission of any person is inconsistent with or is in contravention of a provision of this constitution, may bring an action in the Supreme Court for a declaration to that effect. So the point here then is, anytime any person is of the view that an act has been done, especially by institutions and individuals who hold public office, is inconsistent with a provision of the constitution, any such person may bring an action in the Supreme Court for a declaration. This underscores the role that the Supreme Court plays in ensuring public accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, when public institutions are held to account to the law for actions that they take, the general effect will be to ensure political stability, social cohesion, and then give practical meaning to our representative form of democracy, which we are practicing now. Where public institutions are not held to account for their actions, a time comes when the population will have no confidence in the institutions of governance that we set for ourselves under the law. It is therefore of paramount importance that institutions that exercise powers of government are held to explain their stewardship to the people through the right procedures and processes. In relation to the ongoing election petition, ladies and gentlemen, We may refer to Article 63 of the Constitution. At 
Article 63 of the Constitution talks of the election of president. And it states, a person shall not be a candidate in a presidential election unless he is nominated for election as president by a document which is signed by him and is signed by not less than two persons who are registered voters resident in the area of authority of each district assembly. Then we move on to Article 64. That talks about challenging election of president. And it states, the validity of the election of the president may be challenged only by a citizen of Ghana who may present a petition for the purpose to the Supreme Court within 21 days after the declaration of the result of the election in respect of which the petition is presented. So again, with respect to the election of a president under the 1992 constitution, we encounter the notion of public accountability that a citizen may challenge the validity of the election of a president in the Supreme Court of Ghana. As we speak, the petitioner is in the Supreme Court seeking a declaration that the declaration of one of the candidates in the 2020 December presidential election was unconstitutional, being in violation of a provision of the Constitution. I wish to take issue with the manner in which the Supreme Court has handled some of the issues. And the first issue I would want to look at will be the application by the petitioner to serve a set of questions on the Electoral Commission to answer by way of interrogatories. In the affidavit in support of the application, the petitioner argued that those questions that the Electoral Commission should answer relate to the issues the court has been called upon to answer and resolve. The petitioner demonstrated how relevant those questions would be to the resolution of the issues. He particularly mentioned that the interrogatories will narrow the issues and then facilitate the expeditious resolution of the dispute. The Electoral Commission, which is the first respondent in the petition, resisted this attempt arguing in part that it was an attempt to delay the proceedings of the petition and then to enable the petitioner to fish out facts to make up it, his case. In its ruling, the Supreme Court dismissed the application, arguing that one, the case for relevancy was not made by the petitioner, and two, the interrogatories will delay the expeditious, will undermine the expeditious resolution of the disputes. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to disagree. In the first place, the main issue for resolution by the Supreme Court has to do with the fact that 
according to the petitioner, the declaration of Nanado Dankwa Akufuado as winner of the 2020 presidential election was unconstitutional. And the interrogatories were seeking questions relating exactly to that particular issue and related issues. It is therefore difficult to understand how a question relating to this matter can be irrelevant. Also in the affidavit in support of the application, the petitioner had argued that it will clarify the issues and enable the court to speedily dispose of the matter. So in terms of expedition and in terms of relevancy, it will appear that the petitioner was on point, but the Supreme Court thought otherwise. The second decision of the Supreme Court that I take issue with has to do with its refusal to compel the Electoral Commission to be cross-examined by the petitioner in relation to matters the commission had raised in its answer to the petitioner's petition. The petitioner had challenged the basis on which Nana Dodanko Akufuado was declared president elect under the 2020 election. The Electoral Commission responded, arguing that everything it did was in accordance with the relevant laws. So clearly, there was a joint of issues between the parties in this matter. And taking into account the fact that the Electoral Commission is the body constitutionally mandated to conduct public elections and referenda. And having regard to the fact that the figures and information used to make the declaration were in its custody, it was only fair that the commission represented by its chairperson was allowed to publicly explain how it came by its declaration. The public explanation of its activities in the Supreme Court would have ensured that the Electoral Commission through its chairperson account for its activities in relation to the 2020 elections to the people who are sovereign and for whose welfare the Electoral Commission should be acting. But again, the Supreme Court thought the petitioner was wrong. I also think the Supreme Court was wrong. Why? And this is my reason. Cross-examination serves two purposes. One, it enables the party cross-examining to put his or her theory of the case across and then to undermine the evidence of the witness being cross-examined. But of course, the Supreme Court has taken the position that the Electoral Commission had not given any evidence yet. So the issue of cross-examination did not arise. But when the Electoral Commission had disagreed with the petitioner on the issue the petitioner complained about, and proceeded to file a witness statement, which according to the Supreme Court does not constitute evidence. The general public would be expecting the commission to explain how it came by its 9th January 2021 declaration that Nana Dodanko Akufado won the election. So the cross-examination would have served that purpose too. 
a very important purpose, that the sovereign whose interest the electoral commission should be serving will have the opportunity to hear the electoral commission explain its conduct. It may be an explanation that will not favor the petition, the petitioner or may not favor the electoral commission itself. But whatever the case may be, at least the people would have had the opportunity of holding the electoral commission to publicly explain its conduct. And that would have affirmed the notion that sovereignty resides in the people. And it is in their interest and for their welfare that the powers of government are to be exercised. But in the Supreme Court's ruling, it formulated a rule of evidential burden regarding presidential election challenges in Ghana and made the point that a party, a petitioner in an election petition must lead evidence to prove two things. One, that there were irregularities in the conduct of the elections. Two, that such irregularities resulted in the affected the material outcome of the election. Well, in my view, the formulation of the rule in that manner is too wide to be fair to the people of Ghana. If a petitioner does not make a double barrel allegation that there has been an irregularity that has affected the outcome of the election. Why should that petitioner be burdened with the responsibility of leading evidence to prove such double barrel allegation? It is fair to require a petitioner who alleges that there has been an irregularity and that such irregularity has affected the outcome of the election to lead evidence to prove those two matters. But where a petitioner does not make such an allegation, it will not be fair to require him or her to carry that burden. But the formulation of the rule, general as it is by the Supreme Court, in my view, sets the bar too high for ordinary citizens to challenge presidential elections and makes it too easy for electoral commissions to get away with infractions of the law they may have committed in the course of their duties. Ladies and gentlemen, the petitioner in this case, John Dramani Mahama is a former president. By virtue of his high social standard in our society, he has been able to engage skilled legal representation in this matter. Even so, we all can observe how he has been struggling with these matters. How much more will an ordinary citizen who may not have the resources to procure such skilled legal representation suffer? And in the end of the day, if we have a system that makes it difficult for the citizenry to hold public office holders accountable, then the whole notion that sovereignty resides in the people may ring hollow. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to bear in mind that when the citizenry comes to the realization that the representative political institutions that have been set up to serve their interests are too untouchable, then citizens may choose to take the law into their own hands. And that may not augur well for the integrity of our society. It is my view that the Supreme Court 
may not have deeply reflected on the public interest underpinnings of this matter in its decisions relating to the interrogatories and then the application to, su to subpoena the Electoral Commission to be cross-examined. I will recommend that in future, and I pray and hope that a future Supreme Court that finds itself in similar circumstances may deeply reflect on the enormous public interest underpinnings of an election petition, and then review the precedent that the Supreme Court in the 2021 election petition has set for election petition. The Supreme Court has succeeded in creating a procedural machinery that is too complicated and cumbersome for ordinary citizens to understand and then to operate in relation to challenging presidential election. And that can affect the just outcome of presidential elections. Because when people think that their choice of a candidate in a presidential election has been shortchanged and do not trust that the courts will hold the institution responsible for conducting and supervising such elections accountable, then they may well choose to find their own ways and means of dealing with the matter. It is a matter nobody, not even the Supreme Court, would wish for this country. I end my discussion here. So how can they hear me? Hello? Yes, I can read a question here as to whether the Supreme Court said that the questions were irrelevant or the petitioner failed to prove the relevancy of the question. I think that the court said the case of relevancy had not been made out by the petitioner. Sorry, I was taken off the system for quite some time. I wonder if uh, our comrade has finished. Colleague, have you finished your presentation? Yes, Prof, I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much. So yes, may we please have uh, Albert Kwashiga to share his thoughts with us. Thank you very much for your patience, colleagues. We booked for 500. The system restricted us to 100. We have several of our colleagues on standby. And then suddenly it took me as host off and assigned somebody else. I've only been now, I've only now been able to get back. So I'm sorry about that. Albert.
I have done that. I have admitted everybody. Still, Myself. still, Yana, I can hear you. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Let's move on, Albert. Is Albert back? Um, hello, Prof. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make an input. Maybe he's having a problem with his audio device, so he can maybe install the Zoom onto his mobile phone and join it. Or hello, maybe, I'm here. Or, yeah. or maybe there may be a He's here. Problem with the audio device. He's, Professor Jampo is here, so we'll take him. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay that, that's fine. Prof Jampo. Yes. Hello. Hello, go ahead, please. Oh, am I to start? <laughs> Albert is having difficulty joining in with his audio. So Albert, if you can Albert, Albert has always had difficulty. <laughs> well, he's in difficulty zone. <laughs> so, right, so if we can rescue him. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, my paper is titled um, The Election Petition and the Future of Ghana's Electoral Commission. Election Petition and the Future of Ghana's Electoral Commission. Now, the 2013 election petition at the Supreme Court of Ghana, um, we all know, exposed some monumental flaws in the nation's electoral processes that could not be glossed over in the quest for free, fair, peaceful, and transparent elections. In his ruling, Justice William Atuguba, the president of the panel of judges, then noted that, and I quote, the petition, however, has exposed the need for certain electoral reforms. I mentioned some of them. The voters register must be compiled and made available to the parties as early as possible. A supplementary register may cater for late exigencies. The caliber of presiding officers must be greatly raised up. The pink sheet is to elaborate a much simpler one to meet the pressures of the public. Weariness and lateness of the day at the close of poll, etc., etc. The carbon copying system has to be improved upon. The biometric device system must be streamlined to avoid breakdown and the stress on the electoral uh, and, on the, and the stress on the electorate involved in an adjournment of the poll and invalidating wholesale votes for insignificant SX numbers is not the best application of the administrative principle of the proportionality test. So um, if you look, at, this was just a gist of the, the kinds of things that the judges um, said um, that sort of gave out the marching orders to the electoral commission um, after the 2013 elections to undergo or to put in place mechanisms that would ensure that our electoral processes were fine-tuned to deliver results that are acceptable to all. So following this, the electoral commission itself invited proposals for electoral reforms from about 38 key stakeholders, including political parties, faith-based organizations, professional bodies, and civil society organizations. At the time, 
there was a program called the Institute of Economic Affairs Ghana Political Parties Program that I coordinated. And so the IEGPP, for instance, held series of workshops to review the electoral processes. Now, this culminated in the submission of over 25 proposals for electoral reforms to electoral commission around, you know, on 20th November 2013. Subsequently, um, subsequently in January 2015, the electoral commission inaugurated a 10 member electoral um, electoral reforms committee, um, of which I was a member, to examine the proposals for electoral reform and advise the commission on the implementation of the proposals. The committee, comprising uh, representatives of political parties, representatives of the electoral commission itself, civil society organizations, submitted its report encapsulating about 41 proposals for electoral reform to the commission in April 2013. Now, almost all the reform proposals or close to 90% of the reform proposals were generally accepted by the electoral commission, albeit with some, uh, with, uh, albeit some with few modifications here and there, and others were also slated for further discussions with the political parties before the acceptance and possible implementation. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I may quickly go through some of the proposals um, for electoral reforms that ensued after the 2013 um, election petition. Um, we categorized them into proposals accepted with modifications. One, in, one was the need for well-trained election officials to man the polls. The other is continuous voter registration exercise. Another one is setting up a national coalition center to replace the strong room. Another one is institutionalizing the inter-party advi advisory um, committee meetings. Um, another one is using the biometric verification devices for voter registration and exhibition exercises, raising the minimum educational qualifications requirement for various levels of um, election officials. Um, taking of oath by election officials before um, a judicial officer holding elections in November instead of December, deferring the ad adoption of elect electronic voting, the EC taking steps to reduce rejected ballots. This, this and many others were proposals that were accepted, uh, submitted to Electoral Commission and accepted with some modification. There are, there are a number of them, I won't go through all of them. Then there were also proposals that were accepted in principle but required further discussions at IPAC meeting. These include, number one, no creation of additional constituencies in election year, extending the period of um, voter registration exercise from 14 to 21 days, giving mandate to the Electoral Commission to go to court to seek authority to delete names of unqualified persons from provision, um, provisional voters register, um, the commission must be required by law to give a copy of the final certified register to political parties at least 21 days before elections. Civil society organization must be given full membership of IPAC meetings, reducing the number of voters per polling station, publishing annual calendar of activities of the commission at the beginning of every election year, publishing in the gazette of polling stations with their codes and locations not later than 42 days before elections. Mr. Chairman, there are also quite a number of these proposals that were accepted by the Electoral Commission that were supposed to also be further engaged um, with, in dialogue with the political parties. Now, there were also proposals that were, in fact, it was only one proposal that the Electoral um, Commission rejected. It accepted all apart from one. The only proposal that the Electoral Commission then rejected was that uh, was the proposal for no verification, no vote. Proposal for, even though the Electoral Reforms Committee insisted that the principle of no verification, no vote must be upheld, the Electoral Commission then, under the chairmanship of Prof, um, Dr. Farijan, said no. Um, in the view of the chairman of the Electoral Commission, it would be unfair for machines to determine who is eligible to vote. The commission indeed recognized that the right of a citizen to vote is fundamental and guaranteed by the 1992 constitution. In the view of the commission, 
it has an inherent mandate to ensure that every eligible voter gets the opportunity to vote. Um, the commission therefore argued that in the absence or more functioning of the biometric ver verification device, there should be other physical or manual means of verifying voters in order not to disenfranchise Ghanaians. So basically, um, these were some of the things that ensued after the 2013 election petition. So generally, there were, um, if you look at the ruling of the, uh, the, uh, the court ruling, it gave some form of marching orders to the Electoral Commission um, to embark on the process of reviewing and fine-tuning our uh, electoral processes. And let's quickly look at um, the 2021 um, election petition um, as uh, still ongoing. So unlike um, the 2013 election petition process that interrogated virtually all the concerns raised by petitioners in a manner that exposed their flaws in the nation's electoral processes, um, it appears that the processes now, as we are undergoing, have so far been such that even though there is some general consensus, if you talk to all the political parties behind the scenes, there appear to be some general consensus that there were some challenges with the 2020 elections. Um, but so far, there has not been much opportunity for the courts to delve into the problems for the, um, for the purpose of properly exposing them and making consequential pronouncements that will give the marching orders for further electoral, uh, ele electoral reforms. So issues that deepened the already, already existing trust deficit of the electoral commission the inability of the commission to build the needed relational competence in dialoguing with the opposition to deal with electoral irregularities before declaring results, the challenges encountered during collation of the results, the lack of clarity on what constitutes from 13 and what it must encapsulate, the multiple mistakes that were made in declaring the results and correcting same without allowing key stakeholders to benefit from insights and explanations with regards to the reasons for such changes and the basis for the corrections, among others, for now, I said, Mr. Chairman, I said, for now, appear validated as if they never existed or they are not serious um, challenges. Some of the court rulings, especially, and I'm referring especially to the ones on the application to reopen the case of the petitioner and the one that sought a review of the ruling on the application to reopen the petitioner's case, this time appeared to have sheltered the electoral commission from being accountable in a manner that favored mostly the positivist school in rule application or interpretation that essentially emphasizes judicial restraint and strict application of laws and placed little or no consideration on the dogmas of sociological jurisprudence um, judicial activism and the implications of such moves on the already poisoned public perception about the electoral commission by section of the citizenry. A combination, Mr. Chairman, in my view, of the positivist school, which highlights the letter of the law and sociological jurisprudence, which touches on a purposive interpretation and application of the law, what are the and all involved in this um, dispute together and the process of accountability and transparency has been the spirit behind the laws that were recently applied. I'm sure there's a way to change it. If somebody is, is disturbing, if the person can mute the microphone. Hello. I'm trying to identify infinite, infinite not seven. Yes. Okay, thank you. Professor Jampo, please continue. All right. So, um, Mr. Chair, if coming events cast their shadows, then what I've observed so far from some of the rulings of the courts, um, I've created um, some impression in the minds of people that there were not much challenges with the conduct of the 2020 elections. It is, however, my hope that the final judgment of the court will speak to some of the challenges of the election, elections um, to dispel the impressions that all may have gone well with the 2020 elections. Anything short of this undoubtedly 
would, and, um, would deny Ghana's electoral process from once again benefiting from proposals that would enrich and fine tune um, the electoral processes to ensure the delivery of results that will be acceptable to all. Um, as far as the future of the Electoral Commission is concerned, and as indicated earlier, um, it is my hope that the Supreme Court, in its final judgment, may veer into pronouncements that may give the marching orders to the Electoral Commission to fine tune its activities to deal with some of the issues of the 2020 elections. Also, perhaps, perhaps the Commission may, on its own, after the after the um, court process of 2021, may it may on its own initiate interventions to deal with some of the challenges it suffered and the concerns raised by the petitioners. The difficulty, Mr. Chairman, however, um, the difficulty, however, lies in the fact that such a move to deal with the challenges require a multi-stakeholder engagement that may not be complete without the participation. of the Electoral Commission get the NDC on board such a move, particularly given the absence of a credible dialogue platform like the Ghana Political Parties program. Will there be a concession that the challenges for which the NDC went to court actually exist? If so, how will the Electoral Commission look in the sight of the NDC and the Ghanaian public? If the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, does not make pronouncement in its final judgment that admits the challenges of the 2020 elections. And if the Electoral Commission does not concede that there were challenges too, how will it be able, how will the Commission itself be able to initiate interventions to deal with any challenge? So, Mr. Chairman, these are some puzzling questions um, that, in my view, are difficult to answer. But as we think about the answers, we know that given what has happened, I can tell that the commission will continue to suffer from trust deficits, not only from the opposition party, but possibly from civil society organizations, the general public, and even the ruling party, the current ruling party itself. Given our recent history on the removal of the immediate past chairperson of the electoral commission and her deputies for several reasons, including very ominous political ones, a heightened trust deficit in the commission, Mr. Chairman, needlessly, needless to say, may potentially disturb the security of tenure of its current headship in a manner that, in my view, may undermine continuity and the quest to build strong and independent institutions. Since 1993, there have been several interventions aimed at fine-tuning our electoral processes and, indeed, the aftermath of every election has revealed incontrovertible challenges that have been accepted and worked on to fine tune the electoral processes. It however appears that even though we have seen challenges with our electoral processes after the 2020 elections as indicated earlier on, the tacit non-admission of same by the electoral commission and its refusal to speak to them at the courts using the law makes the commission look like a political ostrich. All stakeholders, including the political party to which the petitioner belongs, the future of Ghana's electoral commission, the discharge of its mandate would remain not too bright. Mr. Chairman, I have so many things to say, but I know that there will be question and answer series for us to come back and all that. And so I would end here, and if there are questions, I will take them and attempt to offer some responses to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jampo, for this brief but detailed presentation. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, our brother Koshiga is ready. If he's, he can connect to us, may he kindly join us. Well, I would like to suggest that once, uh, hello, 
Yes, Prof. Gawa, we are listening to you. Yeah. I'd like to suggest that in view of the difficulty Mr. Kwashiga is facing, we should um, have a, a public discussion on this. The two presentations are detailed enough for us to have an informed discussion. So if we may take the first five questions, then the presenters can respond to them. That will take another set of questions. And then we will adjourn the forum until tomorrow thereafter. And we promise that we'll ensure that we increase the capacity to 500. The original 500 we had booked and paid for the license. And so uh, may we have the first set of five questions for the presenters. Thank you. Prof, you have to unmute, unmute us so that people can uh, ask questions if they want to. Or people can mute themselves and ask questions if they want to. Yes, you can unmute yourself and ask questions, please. Yeah, I can see Audu Sunny. can see your hand up. Hello, Audu. There is another Hello. hand up. There is another hand also up. So if Audu hey. is not ready. If Audu is not ready, JJ, I see JJ. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? No. Any other person who wishes to ask a question? Some of them are saying they are unable to unmute themselves. So it looks like there is something in the system that's preventing them from unmuting themselves. Right now, there's nothing. Okay, so they could ask their questions by typing in the chat in the chat box if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay, and I can read. Okay, can I can I ask my question now? Please go, JJ. All right, so my question um, goes to oh, yeah. either um, oh, yeah. Councilor Pashiga or Councilor yeah. Garcia. Uh, my question has to do with that. Do they think that the principle of the uh, human services attorney general is likely to be applicable to the office of the electoral commissioner, um, having in mind the president that we have just observed that the commissioners have to uh, be taken out of the office. the principle of the human services attorney general being applied to the uh, office of the electoral commissioner going forward? Um,
believe in law. But um, some of us also believe in the dogmas of accountability. And so um, we felt that um, for us to have some form of accountability, um, the chairperson of the commission should have been allowed to at least say something so that there could have been further interrogations, but these didn't happen. And so um, technically, it's just, it's just has been the use of strategy and the use of the law. And the ultimate effect um, have been that um, she's been shielded from I'm answering maybe a few questions that I'm sure the petitioners would have loved to answer. And so that is, that is what it is. But if you ask them, they will tell you that they were, they were adhering strictly to the laws. But I've also said that uh, the positive view of the law that always say that um, always stick to the laws and let the heavens come down. Um, it's not only the view that can be looked at. I mean, there's also the sociological view that also want to look at um, other societal considerations and also want to respect the benefits of judicial activism. The dogmas of the law with other sociological factors in, in order to be able to achieve a decision that will at both the spirit and also the letter of the law. And so basically, that is that. Um, she's not been allowed to answer um, um, and to be interrogated. And um, technically, I would say that yes, um, it amounts to she being shielded. There was also a question as to the future of democracy and how credible is our judicial system. I think um, if you look at how we started um, from authoritarianism up to where we are now, now we are a transitional democracy. Um, Clearly, what are some of the things that we're doing in 1993, if you fast forward to some of the things that we are doing now, um, it tells you that we, have, we are um, gradually learning and at the ladder of democratic progress. To the extent that um, when there was um, disagreement or dissatisfaction about the outcome of the 2020 elections, um, ultimately the matter ended up in court. Tells you that democracy has come to stay. If you see the various Afrobarometer reports on the the state of Ghana's democracy tells you that democracy has come to stay and we it doesn't look like we'll relax. But what I can say is that we would um, gradually climb higher the ladder of democratic progression to even attain higher heights. Uh, higher heights. And you are asking about uh, how credible is our judicial system. I, I think that um, we are all Ghanaians and we are alive and we are seeing um, what is happening. Um, and so I would leave that judgment to, to all of us here. But one thing that we must, we must be mindful of is that um, it appears that the judiciary is one of the remaining um, um, arms, you know, organs of the state um, when it comes to the settlement of disputes and all that. And so it must be credible enough to be able to serve or to be able to receive complaints from, um, from people who may think that they have issues or they have challenges. If it loses its credi credibility, then we are all dead because the people may want to take um, the laws of, um, into their own hands and all that. And so um, my response to that question is that um, let us judge by ourselves individually, but I'll call on the judiciary uh, or the judicial arm of government to ensure that it maintains its standards um, with the view to encouraging all not to want to take the laws into their own arms. Already you've, you've heard people saying that if that is the case, in fact, we heard this in um, 2013, and then we are hearing it now, that if that is the case, um, um, if you don't take care, um, elections will be fought and won or lost at the polling sta um, stations. 
um, we may not take our matter to court. If that happens, then um, it may be problem. I mean, it may be problematic for us as a people. And so um, we are all yearning for a very credible judicial arm of government that would um, ensure that um, people would easily want to take their cases um, to them rather than um, wanting to take the laws of the land into their own hands. Then you are asking of criteria for empaneling um, judges. I thought um, I would leave that to the lawyer, my colleague, um, lawyer Gordon Adagwene. But um, maybe all that I want to say is that uh, I don't think that um, um, it is we can force, we can, we can insist that the chair or the chief justice should not sit on any case. It's the chief justice that empanels um, judges to sit on any case. And in, and in empaneling um, judges to sit on the case, I think nothing prevents him or her um, from sitting as, you know, also as a panel. Uh, and so I think that is that. Just that, uh, in my view, if you have um, the chief justice not certain, um, the likelihood, I'm talking about the human nature, the likelihood of all the judges seeing themselves as equal um, is higher than having the chief justice also certain as a member of the panel. The chief justices are the member of the panel. There is, it is also possible that the remaining judges may see themselves as well certain with their boss and it will have its own implications and all that. So basically, that's what I'll say. Godwin, if you have something more to add, um, I'll leave that to you. Thank you, Professor Jampo. Godwin, anything to add? Hello, Godwin. Okay, before Gordon comes in, let me just um, inform that we have invited a number of media houses to join us. We are unable to determine whether or not they are here with us, but we strongly believe that many of them are here. We have TV3, UTV, Ghana News Agency, Joy, Joy News, GBC Radio, The Ghanaian Times, Daily Graphic, Modern Ghana. Graphic Online, Ghana Web, and City FM. We also expect TV XYZ to be with us. Thank you very much. Godwin, if you have anything to add to what Professor Jampu has said, may you kindly do so. Otherwise, I see three hands up. Mr. Datsun, kindly unmute your mic and ask your question or make your contribution. Oh, Excuse me, Nana's iPhone. The person using Nana's iPhone, you and your children are interfering with the smooth flow of the program, please. If Mr. Dustin is not ready, Huawei Y9 2019, 2019, I see your hand up. Kindly unmute your mic and ask your question. Yeah, bro. Hello, um, hello, wait, hello. Wait, wait. My my question was can, can, can I ask a question? Yes, please. I, I had I had a question earlier on, but one leg of my question has been answered, but the second leg has not been answered. Has uh, that I was asking uh, Dr. Gordon, um, if the judgment, the judgment according to the Supreme Court was that, and the petitioner has failed to prove relevance of the case, that is the interrogate interrogatories uh, that uh, it, it it pleaded. 
that it has failed to prove its relevance. Does that equate to the questions being irrelevant? And if so, does it mean that they are the same in law and if not staining? Have you closed? And the second one is that, uh, the second one is basically uh, my uh, a contribution. I think the Supreme Court, we shouldn't allow the Supreme Court to determine who has won and has not won election. The Supreme Court should be a constitutional court, should be able to interpret to us what the constitution is saying and what the law is saying. But to go into figures and understand the nitty gritty of figures is not the duty of a Supreme Court. Otherwise, it will be taking up uh, responsibility that it has no competence. So in this particular uh, 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 hearing, I've, I've seen a lot of disturbing rulings in that a Supreme Court is trying to go into election, conducting election, not looking at the irregularities or the laws uh, governing conducting election. And it is getting disturbing to the point that the Ghanaian, ordinary Ghanaian, who for some day or for some reason will not even take the Supreme Court ruling any serious. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Datsun, do you have anything to ask? I still see your hand up. Otherwise, Richard Ahija. Yes, oh, sir, okay. Prof. Uh, uh, yeah, Richard, thank you very much for, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I had uh, posted my question on the platform. Um, we've been following the proceedings in court and uh, we've been listening to professionals and uh, several site organizations, mm -hmm. uh, including your good uh, panelist, uh, Professor Jampo and uh, uh, lawyer uh, Aguene, on various media platforms. They make very good points. I have not taken pains to look at the CI 99 in its entirety. I have a question. My question is about the doctrine of amicus curiae. I'm not a lawyer, but the way the court proceedings is going, I see the petitioners, uh, lawyers making very sound arguments founded on legal mm -hmm. grounds, but it looks like they need some help. And if people like uh, Professor Ransford, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, Professor Kweku Asari, and other civil society organizations like Imani and Co. If they could travel to the court on this doctrine, I believe it would be a very good intervention for public good and for social cohesion. I don't know what the panelists think. I pause. Thank you very much. Uh, since many are having difficulty in unmuting themselves, I encourage you to post your questions on the chat room so I can read them. We have one here from Abdul Malik to everyone. It says, please, Prof, I'd like to know whether or not future Supreme Court can grant interrogatories in an election petition. Then it continues. And law, act, and regulations with the courts relied on as this current Supreme Court ruled, the court is unable to apply CI-47 because of CI-99. So the question is, will future Supreme Court be able to grant interrogatories in this regard? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have the input of that question. Um, Gavua, my hands are up. Yes, uh, Dr. Agbano, please go ahead. I want to ask what the ultimate goal of any judicial system is. Is it law or justice or a combination of both? Am I, have I been heard? <laughs> 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 you are you are head. <laughs> yes, you have been heard. So let's okay. move to the next question. I saw a hand up right now. Mukaila Abdullah. Oh. 
focus. Yes, sir, Abdul Malik. Thank you very much, Prof. A very good evening to you um, and to our cherished uh, participants. I think you read one of my questions, but I realized that there was some typo errors in respect of um, that particular question, but um, a very quick one. I would like to know from our great uh, lawyers whether um, after this particular ruling on the 4th of March, there would be an opportunity for any of the parties to go for appeal so to ask. And then also the question I wanted to ask earlier is that I want to know from Prof whether or not future Supreme Courts will be able to grant interlocutories in an election petition and which law or act and or regulation would the court apply in granting such? Because following the proceedings, um, um, it looks like the court sought to create an impression that interlocutories which are found in CI 49, 47 cannot be applied or is inapplicable because of um, um, CI uh, uh, 99, which uh, to admit, I've not read it in its entirety, but it basically talks about time and some other um, court proceedings. So I would like to know from Prof, if future Supreme Court would be able to grant that, which law? And would that mean, that suggests that they will set aside this particular rule and what is the consequences on those justices that sat on this particular case? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have one question here from Abdul Mumin. I says, Mr. Chairman, my concern is that so much power has been vested on the judiciary. Can there be a national conversation to put a mechanism to check that arm of government? Fine, I think we've all heard it. Now, the next question comes from an unidentifiable person with Huawei Y9 2019. It says, Professor Jampo, on the issue of accountability, if the Supreme Court finally says there were errors, but that they were not significant enough to change the outcome of the election, of the election, um, would you still hold the view that the election electoral commission should have been allowed to be cross-examined? That's the, the question I have here. Okay. Do we have any other question? We have about five minutes more. Okay, Professor Jampo, would you kindly respond to the questions as you may? Well, well the, the, the one from Abdul Malik, I thought it was Kukubako, but I didn't see Kukubako added. Um, I, I think that one is pure law and Gordon Adagwini and if Richard Kwashiga, as if he's still here, um, can take up um, those um, responses. But um, my teacher, um, Dr. Hari Agbanu, was asking, um, what is the goal of the judiciary? I know that in podcast science, we teach so many reasons or functions and goals for having the judicial arm of government. Um, key among them is to uh, the power granted them to grant statute or um, the, the power of statutory interpretation. Um, they are uh, um, the arm, um, they, they constitute the organ of government that, that gives interpretation to every rule, particularly when there is dispute. And so um, you may have read the laws of the land and know what it means and all that. But later, there is dispute is a court that will give interpretation to it. They are also there to promote human rights, and um, it is it is it is the, the goal. And then also they are also there to settle and adjudicate or settle settle disputes whenever they rise and all that. In so doing, these and other functions they perform in every democratic dispensation. In so doing. They are supposed to um, ensure the achievement of, like you said, um, a lawful society. And in so doing, also, they are supposed to ensure that there is justice, and not only justice, but also peace. And so they are supposed to ensure that we live in a lawful society um, in the conduct of the activities, the activities, the, the outcomes or the pronouncement that they make by way of judgment 
should bring about justice and not only justice, but also peace. And then also somebody said there should be a national, whether there shouldn't be a national conversation um, on mechanisms yeah. that would check um, the exercise of judicial powers in Ghana. You know, um, judiciary, the judicial arm of government, even without talking about law, um, they have mechanisms that are given to them to ensure that they are independent. And so in political science, we teach judicial independence. And judicial independence is essentially um, ability of judges to um, exist without control or interference from any other arm of government. And then also the fact that they must um, ensure the conduct of their duties without fear or favor and all that. So they are supposed to be independent. And, and there are so many mechanisms that are put in place to ensure that they are independent. For instance, their salaries are charged on, on the consolidated fund and some of them will have to retire on their salaries and so many mechanisms that are put in place to ensure that they are independent. One mechanism is even their right or their power to commit people for contempt. So if you say things that they feel are contemptuous of the court, um, they, can, they, can sub, um, they can bring you before them and charge you and all that. They are supposed to be independent. But um, I, I think that independent judiciary is not... Uh, does not mean that they must also not be accountable to the people. And so I would agree. Uh, we, have not thought, uh, we have not spoken about this um, in a long while because um, um, Ghanaians, we like the farmer Nami syndrome and all that. So we don't really interrogate some of these issues. But I would agree with you that um, if there is a call for us to rethink judicial independence, um, in a manner that syncs with accountability, uh, it should be a right call. So that, yes, judges of the courts are supposed to be independent and we are supposed to respect them. But at what point in time will we say that um, your independence does not, shouldn't undermine our freedom? Your independence shouldn't also make you less accountable to the people. We should begin to have a conversation like that so that um, in, independence must go with accountability. After all, they don't, they, don't con, they don't conjure their own salaries. Their salaries are charged on the consolidated fund. And where do we get money from the consolidated fund? It's the taxes of the people. And so judicial independence, yes, must be respected. But there should also be judicial accountability. And also judicial independence must never be coterminous with... Um, um, uh, the fact that judges should all of a sudden um, lord it over all the people and they must instill fear in the people. And so I believe that there can be, and that's particularly given the recent, uh, recent um, occurrence uh, where we are told one lawyer of the um, judicial system has written to the media house and then the, the contents of the, of the court uh, of the letter is such that if you really want to subject them to strict analysis, then we may be thinking about relapsing into the dark days of culture of silence. And we've heard how the, the DJA also responded. Some are saying it is a bit harsh and all that. But uh, um, I, I think that um, it, it, opens, it opens the door for us to rethink what we call judicial independence. And, and to see whether we can have some agreement, a late consensus as to what it means and what it doesn't mean. So that the fact that you have judicial independence wouldn't also mean that um, our own freedoms and rights would have to be threatened and all that. Then someone also asked, um, what would be my position if the court says that um, there were errors, but these were not um, enough to change the outcome of the 2020 elections. I would still hold the view that there should be election, ref um, uh, there should be a, um, elect uh, electoral reforms. You know, in the, 2013, in the 2013 election petition, I think the ruling was almost the same, that yes, there were errors, but um, these errors um, 
did not um, would not do anything significantly to the outcome of the of the of the election. And so the fact that the errors were not significant to change the election results does not mean that they should um, be relegated to the background or we should pretend that these errors um, never occurred. Um, we would have to revisit them or we have to face them frontally. If you look at what has happened since 1993, every election provides us with an opportunity to um, review and fine tune our electoral processes and all that. And so if my view is that we will, even though the errors may not be, if they say, even though the errors may not be significant to change the election results, um, it, it will not necessarily mean that, so because of that, we should not um, undergo election, um, um, electoral reforms. And if we, we hold or we believe that our electoral processes should still be fine-tuned, then my position is that um, regardless of whether the errors were enough or not enough, my position is that there, there should have been opportunity for the electoral, electoral commission's chairperson to say something to Ghanaians, and there should have been the opportunity for her to have been um, interrogated mm -hmm. and examined just for the purposes of deepening or not throwing the principles of accountability and transparency you know, away. Thank you, Professor Jampu. We are grinding slowly towards the end of the session, but we have a few questions here. Uh, let me go to the chat room again. JJ said that his question has not been answered as to whether or not the principles of J.H. Mensah versus Attorney General will be applicable to the office of EC going forward. Um, I should announce that, unfortunately, Godwin, Dean Godwin has to uh, drop off suddenly uh, due to unforeseen um, challenges. And so we don't have a legal person on the panel today, but that doesn't mean the question will not be addressed. We'll raise it again tomorrow. So I will, unless Professor Jampo has a view on that. Another question from, another question from Haisatu Abuba says, what are the possibilities left for the NDC in case the ruling, the ruling comes out unfavorably? Thank you. Then there's a third one. Are there bodies to check the bodies or mechanisms to check decisions arrived at by judges so that their individual biases do not come to bear on judicial decision or cases mm. they are to pass. No on. The, it's the, abortion. the last one here Oops. says, I think Professor Jampa has not answered Dr. Agbaru's question. The question is that what is the ultimate goal of the judiciary? What is this? This going by ingredients. You buy twenty this to Excuse me, Doctor Shafik. It appears you are saying something which is disturbing the flow. Okay, let's go back. I think Doctor Jampo has In not answered Doctor Doctor Agbano's question. The question is that: What is the ultimate goal of the judiciary? Is it to ensure justice, the law, or both? I think the lawyers should respond to this question. Okay, then not. Professor Jampu. With respect to accountability, ensuring that the, the best strengths for the judiciary are removed from the control of the executive will go a long way to produce direct accountability of the judiciary to the people. What do you say to that? Then finally, we have given current global legal practice. Is the practice of contempt of court outdated or obsolete. Now, these are questions that we would need some of our legal brains uh, to assist us to understand. And I would like to say that uh, unless Professor Jampo has something else to add as a, a sum up to the presentation. Well, let, let me attempt to answer a few, uh, st st state my views on a few of the questions Thank that you, sir. Have been, yeah. So somebody is asking what happens if the matter does not, um, uh, what happens if the matter does not go the way of the NDC um, on, on, on Thursday? <laughs> the point is, um, 
right from the word go, there's been application for review and reviews and reviews. So if they give a ruling and um, the NDC is not um, happy, they are of course free to apply for a review again. But of course, the Supreme Court is not bound to review its own decision unless you prove, you, you convince them well. And so that is that. If it doesn't go your, favor, your way, you can request for a review. But if you go for a review and they said, well, we stand um, where we are standing, then maybe you have to go and consider um, um, maybe preparing yourself for another election or something. The next point is, um, are, are there mechanisms to check the biases of judges from um, intruding into their judgment and all that? You see, judges are also human beings. There are so many things there are so many considerations that influence whatever they do. Number one is number one is the law, but then beyond the law, they are human beings. Um, um, in social science, you say you are part of the reality. The individual is part of the reality, and so sometimes it becomes very difficult for one to keep his own biases at bay. It may influence in a way. Apart, the only judge whose biases may not influence um, his judgment, maybe God. But apart from that, it, 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 whether you like it or not, some biases, they all have their ideological orientations, they have their beliefs, they have um, what they, they, they know and what, what they feel is right and all that. So um, all over the world, um, judges have biases. They have their ideological orientations and all that. And some of these things, but apart from the law, that is the core factor that influences them. Their biases would necessarily um, also intrude into whatever um, they do. But um, um, as to the extent to which these biases would intrude is what we may, we may have to interrogate and all that. Then the other one is um, me coming back to the ultimate goal of every judiciary. Yes, as a political scientist, I'll tell you that the ultimate goal of every judiciary is to create a just and peaceful society. To create a just and peaceful society. And finally, somebody was asking whether the principle or the idea of contempt of court, uh, whether it is not obsolete in a modern day democracy. I think that in order for us to continue to protect judicial independence, in order for us not to run or ruin the judiciary, I'm telling you that if you don't have the courts, then we would as well, we must as well revert to the state of nature that um, Thomas Hobbes um, painted, where uh, it was so much of a lawless society where life of man was nasty, brutish, and short, and there are so many things happening there. And so you would always need the judiciary in every democracy to ensure law and order and to protect human rights, and like I indicated earlier on, to create a peaceful and just society. If we really cherish these values, then we must not um, think about abandoning abandoning the, um, the principles of contempt because human beings are human beings. Sometimes we become overly emotional and we say things that scandalizes um, the court. We have the right to critique decisions of, 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 of the courts, but we have to do so in a manner that would not um, totally ruin um, uh, our justice system. If we succeed in ruining our justice system, then we would have ourselves to blame. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Professor Jampo. Um, any meeting that discusses issues of public interest that runs beyond two hours I think it's not healthy for us because the brain can only take so much. So on that note, I would like to thank you all for your patience. This is the beginning of um, a series of public fora that the progressive intellectuals would be organizing 
to educate the general public about things, affairs that affect all of us as Ghanaians and for which we wish a better future. We, in our attempt to make our world a, a better place for us to live, and we should all endeavor to show our social responsibility. We shall continue tomorrow. And since we're, we were unable to connect with lawyer Albert Koshiga this afternoon, we'll endeavor to have him on tomorrow. In addition to Mr. Kwesi Pratt Jr., who will be the main speaker tomorrow in addition to Albert Koshiga, we sincerely apologize for the technical challenges we had today. The road to success is never smooth and the way to heaven is never straight. We will endeavor, we will try everything possible to address the technical challenges tomorrow and we will increase the capacity to 500 because we have so many people who are unable to join in today. Tomorrow we shall increase the capacity to allow for larger participation. We also notice that we've had a number of our colleague NPP lawyers join in. We are very much grateful because that is the essence of this public discussion, to have divergent views uh, that would ensure that people are better and well informed. We are very grateful for their presence. And uh, on that note, I wish to thank you all for your patience and encourage you to join us again tomorrow at three o'clock. The line should be open at quarter to three so we can start right on time. And please encourage the rest of our colleagues, friends, comrades who were unable to join in today that tomorrow we'll have another good session. And this will be the first set of a number of series that the progressive intellectuals will be organizing. On that note, I thank you all for joining in and may God bless you and bless our beloved nation, Ghana. Thank you very much.